that and all that stuff. What we don't focus on is that background, the fact that every time the award is given, there's so much dissatisfaction as well. We need to question, the Taoist suggests, which is it appropriate to focus on and where the cost-benefit analysis is. Prizing no treasures keeps people from stealing. Again, pretty obvious. Theft is motivated when things are seen as especially valuable and important and available only to a few places. So the positive value of having treasure is often valorized without noticing the negative content that it creates covetousness. Thus the text says, The rule of the sage empties the mind but fills the stomach, weakens the will but strengthens the bones. Some very nice metaphors here. When we talk about emptying the mind but filling the stomach, the metaphor here is this. The mind is the part that's doing all the conceptualizing, positing. This is really good. That's bad. I want that. I need that. Picking things out against the background. But the idea of the stomach, the stomach is the metaphor here for naturalness because it's natural to get hungry when, we, when our stomach is empty. Our stomach kind of drives us through instinct, the mind through calculation. So when the text says that the rule of the sage empties the mind but fills the stomach, it means it's sort of this, that if you're smart in administration, you get people to stop calculating and thinking about things but to work spontaneously. Weakens the will, that is it stops people from striving after these very particular goals, right? Identifying this award as what I'm trying to get, this prize as what I'm trying to get, this achievement as what I need to do, but strengthens the bones, creates a healthier structure. So here again, we have an emphasis on getting rid of the foreground, toning it down a bit, paying attention to the background, lower the contrast on life. It's a nice way to think about it. It's also suggesting that there are big problems that arise when we fix models of success. We get envy, we get a monolithic model of excellence that occludes other possibilities. And it also reflects the idea that there's not one way of doing things. That person who got the Pulitzer Prize for journalism, well, that doesn't suggest that's the only way to do journalism. But the prize emphasizes the only way. And so it misses all of the other ways. It establishes intuitively, if not explicitly, one Tao as constant, as permanent, and occludes all of the other options. And that's why we want to empty that mind and fill the stomach to reduce greed and so forth. We could see this as a model of living softly, or as I like to think about it, living at low contrast. We're next going to turn to chapter 38. And in chapter 38, we're going to be looking at the Taoist valuation of effort and of conceptualization when we go about thinking about moral action. Because think about this for a minute. When we hit Aristotle a bit earlier in this course of lectures, we noticed that Aristotle emphasized that virtue required effort. It was hard to be good. We had to strive for it. We had to cultivate ourselves. We had to develop virtue. And happiness required and virtuous action required a lot of conceptualization. It required us to have practical wisdom, skill in deliberation, skill in making the right choices. That view is shared in the Confucian account. That is, becoming a cultivated person with ritual propriety, filial piety, and so forth, requires a great deal of effort, grinding, polishing, and so forth, and a great deal of thought, understanding those classics, understanding what's to be done. We're going to see that the Taoists are going to reject all of that. We're also going to see an explicit denigration of Confucian accounts of justice and of ritual. And there's a beautiful irony in this passage, and I want you to pay attention to the language and the poetry, because there's a very pretty, ironic account of what happens to societies as they focus on morality. And it has a lot to say about contemporary American society, I think. So we're in chapter 38. When the way is lost, virtue appears. When virtue is lost, kindness appears. When kindness is lost, justice appears. Let's stop at this point and talk about this for a moment. What's the way? That's the Tao. That is just spontaneous behavior in accordance with nature. When we lose the ability to do that, 
when we suddenly lose our spontaneity by getting caught up in our conventions, in our concepts, in our focus on the foreground and ignoring the background, we need some way to get us to behave. And what we get is a doctrine of virtue, the doctrine of day, the doctrine of moral obligation and so forth. So we study how we should behave. The Confucian idea is that this is often one thought too many. I'm going to give you an analogy that comes from a wonderful discussion in Western philosophy. Suppose that you were sick in the hospital and your friend came to visit you and you said, it's so kind of you to come. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. I thought about it morally and I thought that I was obligated to come and that's what virtue demanded. So that's why I came. One thought too many. All of a sudden, an act of spontaneous kindness that you would have enjoyed, an act of spontaneous engagement, a way of being, got replaced with virtue. And all of a sudden, things aren't quite so beautiful as you thought they were. When virtue is lost, kindness appears. Now we're moving down the um, Confucian hierarchy, right? If we, when we don't any longer have our virtue, then we have to instruct people to at least be kind to one another. They might not be honest, they might not be following all of their duties, but at least be nice. But what happens when kindness is lost? When people stop even being nice to each other, then we need justice. Then we need the courts. Then we need somebody to say, all right, if you're not going to be nice to each other, at least be fair. So now we've got a hierarchy. The way, the natural way of being, then virtue, then kindness, then justice. And notice how much in our society we think of justice as one of those highest virtues, something exalted. The Taoist here is putting it way down on the hierarchy. But what happens when justice is lost? I'll read to you. When justice is lost, ritual appears. And ritual marks the waning of belief and the onset of confusion. Now, of course, having just been paying attention to all of this Confucian doctrine, we see what the target is here, right? That if you lose even justice, then what people do is start going ritually through the forms of behavior. And there's not even any pretense that there's fairness or equity anymore. We're just doing what one ought to, behaving comme il faut. And at that point, as the text says, we've got the waning of belief and the onset of confusion. People are just behaving in particular ways only because they know that's the way people behave. That's the right way to behave. They're putting the fork on the left and the knife on the right, but they're not worrying about whether you know, each person has an appropriate share of the food, let alone being nice to each other, let alone behaving virtuously, let alone behaving spontaneously. So in this wonderful chapter on morality, we see a kind of negative valuation of effort in what it takes to be human. In each of these stages we see etiquette, propriety, requires more effort of us, conscious effort moment to moment, than does justice. Justice requires more effort than does kindness. Kindness requires more effort than cultivated virtue. Cultivated virtue requires more calculated effort than simply behaving naturally and humanly. So the idea here is that the most effortless kind of behavior, the most spontaneous kind of behavior, is the best. Effort, cultivation, striving, thinking about what we're doing, emerge only as necessities when we lose our character, when we lose what's really important. We also find here, more specifically with respect to the kind of Confucian context, a specific denigration of justice and ritual, a specific denigration of the explicit forms of behavior, forms of social intercourse, and the most um, ritualized, calcified, specified, and explicit forms of social interaction. If we think about justice, the signing of contracts, courtroom procedure, and if we think about ritual in this highly etiquette um, etiquettized sense of ritual, where each kind of interaction has its own form of language, its own form of behavior, then what we're thinking about is the most fossilized forms of interpersonal interaction in which we engage. The most fossilized, the least natural. 
those are often the ones that people valorize as the foundations of our social order. The Confucians, for instance, valorize those.